When you think about the Holy Spirit, what comes to mind? I've asked this question to so many people, and I've been so surprised to hear the diversity of responses. The answers range from a little voice in my head, almost like my conscience, to a mystical power like the force mentioned in the Star Wars saga. However, the Bible introduces the Holy Spirit to us as a person and not as a power. There are actually three pieces of evidence that we find in the Bible for this. The first one is that the Holy Spirit acts in a personal sense. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, it reads that no one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. The Holy Spirit knows things. He has knowledge. Electricity doesn't have knowledge. Power can't know things. Then in 1 Corinthians 12 verses 11, we read the following. It says, it is the one and only spirit who distributes all of these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The Holy Spirit has a will. He can make decisions. Electricity can't do that. Only a person can do that. So firstly, the Holy Spirit acts in a personal sense. Then secondly, the Holy Spirit has emotions. In Ephesians 4 verse 30, we read the following, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit. Other translations says that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. It's interesting to see this because you can only upset a person. You cannot upset a thing. You can't grieve a power like electricity. You can only grieve a person. So firstly, he acts in a personal sense. Secondly, the Holy Spirit has emotions. And then thirdly, and lastly, the Holy Spirit has personal titles. John actually breaks Greek grammar to point this out to us. In John chapter 14, verse 26, he writes the following, Jesus speaking, But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you, not it will, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I've told you. Now, this has a profound implication for how we relate to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, it means that we can and we should have a relationship with Him. And I know this idea of having a relationship with the Holy Spirit is probably a new one. It's been a new one to many people that I know and I've spoken to, even if they know Jesus for quite a long time. However, the truth is that Jesus gave His life so that you and I can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So, what kind of relationship do we have with the Holy Spirit? And how are we to go about cultivating this relationship? Well, the kind of relationship that we have with the Holy Spirit. Let's tackle that one first. Many people make the mistake to engage in a consumer relationship with the Holy Spirit. Very much like the relationship you would have with your grocer down the street. You see, the consumer relationship you have with your grocer centers around the product or service that he or she produces. And when this product or service no longer fits your liking, you just leave and find another grocer. Sadly, many times people treat the Holy Spirit like a service provider that should give us the desired experience or gift. And if not, we go and search for it elsewhere. However, the true nature of our relationship with the Holy Spirit is far more wonderful than we could have ever imagined. You see, the kind of relationship we get to have with the Holy Spirit is what the Bible calls a covenant relationship. Now, this might be a very strange term to most of us, but the best example I can offer you of a covenant relationship is that of a parent-child relationship. You see, firstly, in this relationship, there is something far more permanent that keeps us together than just some or other common interest or a service that's provided. In a covenant, we are bound together for life because of the blood that flows through our veins. 
And in the same way, our relationship with the Holy Spirit is secured by the blood of Jesus. This means nothing we do can end our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? It's great news. Then secondly, a child gets to enjoy all the benefits of being in a loving family without having to keep the terms of the covenant relationship. As long as mom and dad keep their covenant vows they made to God the day they got married, children will enjoy a safe, stable, and loving home. In the same way, we get to enjoy the benefits of the eternal, unbreakable covenant God made through Jesus' blood. As born-again children of God, one of these benefits we get to enjoy is having an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. So now that we know what kind of relationship we're in, how do we cultivate, how do we grow this relationship with the Holy Spirit? Well, I believe that when cultivating a relationship with the Holy Spirit, it's important to recognize who we are in relationship with. The Holy Spirit is God. He is the vine. And therefore, we honor and love Him by obeying His instructions and following His guidance. To treasure this relationship is by far the most important thing any Christ follower can do. Paul puts it like this. He says that we are to count everything as loss in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ. And it's only through the Holy Spirit that we can know and we can follow Jesus. So, for the rest of our time together, I'd like to invite you as we're going to explore the four invitations we find in the Bible regarding our relationship with the Holy Spirit.